Okay, well, first of all, I want to thank Katie for the invitation. Uh, it's great to, you know, see all these familiar people and faces around. And uh, after the great talk by Joaquin about real science, today I'm going to talk about Twitter. Sorry about it. So, well, my talk is uh, called The Right of the Social Bots. And uh, in particular, I'm going to talk about how to fight deception and misinformation in uh, online social media. Uh, I, I want to start with a sort of a consideration that I suppose everyone will share with me. Uh, let's all agree that during the last century and a half, we moved from essentially a paradigm in which information diffusion was broadcasted by probably some uh, very limited amount of individuals, and the credibility of these individuals was sort of uh, broadly uh, acknowledged, in this case, for example, President Lincoln, uh, and later on by more traditional media like uh, newspapers and later on uh, the TV and so forth and so on. Uh, nowadays we are living uh, in an information revolution, another phase of this information revolution in which everyone becomes not only an information consumer but also an information producer. So in this uh, either democratic scenario in which uh, everyone can go online and tell uh, their own opinions or spread some facts or, you know, share some information, there are vast societal consequences. Think about, for example, the Arab Springs or all the social protests and social movements that we witnessed during the last five or six years, uh, including, you know, Occupy Wall Street in the United States, the protests in Spain, the Cinco de Mayo, and so forth and so on. Many people uh, uh, try to argue that Without social media, this protest would have, you know, wouldn't happen. I'm not so keen about it, but uh, at least I can definitely see the value of social media in uh, sort of coordinating uh, uh, the efforts of the individuals, but also allow to frame the entire conversation, what are the goals of the protests, what are the sort of reasons of the dissent, and so forth and so on. So in these uh, sort of framework, and we analyzed a lot of these examples in our research at the Center for Complex Systems in the last three or four years. In this framework, under this framework, there are two important facts that we need to sort of acknowledge. We want to assess the credibility of the individuals behind uh, the information spreading, and we want to also determine the veridicity and the accuracy of the information that spreads. And this is pretty much what we have been doing in, uh, the, the, you know, in the context of the two projects that I'm going to present today. The first one is so-called social bot detection. A social bot is a, a sort of entity online that tries to mimic the uh, behavior of a human, but it's essentially synthetic. It's an algorithm. It's a computer program that performs some you know, actions like uh, posting content on Twitter or following other individuals, interacting, generating, um, you know, spreading information, news, and so forth and so on. Of course, it's really important to determine whether uh, uh, an account is a social bot. I, I will try to argue that in a second, the importance of the problem. But uh, so essentially the task is this one, right? We have an individual. It can be a credible individual like the president or not. It's online. It's a persona. He has a profile. I want to determine whether this profile in Twitter is sort of um, governed by an entity, a human entity, or a computer program. So why do we care? Well, I want to argue, first of all, that the majority of social bots are designed to be harmful. So they are dangerous, in a sense, for our society. For example, these uh, computer programs are used to run political smearing campaigns, deception campaigns, misinformation campaigns, and so forth and so on. We have very broad evidence of this. It's entirely bipartisan, for example, in the case of politics. It's not you know, a left-leaning or a you know, right-leaning strategy. Everyone does it. And of course, when these you know, strategies are sort of uh, unveiled, uh, you know, they sort of affect the credibility of the individuals, right? So there is something fishy already at this level, but I can argue that it's even more important than that. There is a huge implication in terms of economics, in terms of uh, finance. For example, um, um, here at Indiana University, uh, we have Johan Bollen, who is uh, one of the early proposers of using social media data for training and predicting stock market fluctuations, right? What happens if uh, social bots affect somehow the social media data stream and the conversation and create, for example, buzz or hype around the concept, around, for example, uh, 
a name, a brand, an entity, a company, and uh, this entity uh, makes a profit out of it. This is what actually happened a few months ago. There is a guy, single guy in a garage, uh, you know, he started this company called Sync, and uh, the company doesn't do anything. It's uh, on the stock market. It doesn't produce any, you know, product or stuff like that. The only thing that this guy does in his garage is creating a, a you know, a legion of social bots online. At some point, he activates the bots. The bots start tweeting about Sync. You know, these uh, highly, you know, high-frequency automatic trading algorithm pick this discussion, and they think that there is a huge buzz from, you know, thousands and thousands of people online about sync. So probably they're gonna release some big product, some you know, revolutionary technology, and they start trading like crazy the, you know, the stocks. So in a few minutes, the company literally goes from a few hundred thousand dollars value to five billions. The guy you know, cashes out and disappears, makes a lot of profit. So this is another effect, you know, and many people of course are upset because they lost five billion dollars in these you know, fake uh, stocks. There are many other, you know, examples of this, but I think I, you know, I brought enough argument. Uh, they are used for spam, for social pollution, and so forth and so on. Sometimes bots are also created uh, with, uh, uh, with different goals. For example, they might be benign, not necessarily harmful by design, but they, be, they can also be dangerous. For example, there are bots that retweet rebroadcast information automatically. And uh, w per se, this is not a problem, but it becomes a problem when you spread misinformation, when you spread, spread inaccurate facts, rumors. And this is what happened uh, a few months ago when the Syrian electronic hack, uh, hacker uh, army hacked into the Associated Press account, Twitter account, and brought this tweet here, bringing news to explosions at the White House, the president is injured. Of course, this never happened in the real world, but in the online world, what happened is that thousands, hundreds of thousands of retweets of this tweet spread online in a few minutes, and this has an effect in the real world. In fact, there was one of the largest one-point drop uh, in the stock market, in, actually in the Dow Jones, which uh, caused $136 billion to vanish uh, in a matter of minutes. And you know, it took only three, four, five minutes to the Associate Press to realize that the account was hacked. They deleted the tweet, but the damage was already you know, done. So, the problem of detecting bots online and in general synthetic conversation, synthetic activity is uh, somehow of great social e economic value. I'm gonna show you an example of how our system works and then I will give you like a two minutes overview of the technical aspects. There is this website, trudy.indiana.edu slash bot or not. Everyone can access it as long as you have a Twitter account. You log in and you can query any Twitter account. You just write the username of that Twitter account and uh, our framework uh, essentially queries in real time the Twitter API and gives back, gets back the public information about this account, about the friends of this account, the contacts, the content produced by this account, and so forth and so on. And uh, a lot of real time analysis is run, and uh, after a few seconds you wait, the machinery crunches the number and then gives you likelihood score that this account is a bot, a social bot, or a human. If the score is low, like in this case 12%, Essentially, our framework tells that the probability that the account you are analyzing is a bot is very low. And uh, it, doesn't only, uh, account, it doesn't only make this prediction, prediction based on the information of the user, but it does it using uh, uh, you know, a wide range of information. For example, information about friends of these users, information about the content that this user posts, information about the sentiment of the content posted by the user information about the temporal pattern of activities such as you know, tweeting, retweeting, and so forth and so on, network information or diffusion of his content and much else. It doesn't, it doesn't give you only the likelihood, it also provides many uh, interactive visualizations that allow you to make a sort of a, sort of get some insights uh, about this activity. For example, uh, there is a, you know, a sort of temporal patterns of consumption and production of tweets and retweets. On the right side here, we have uh, the network of uh, hashtag co-occurring in the content produced by this user, which means essentially the topics this person is interested in and post, posts about. And then we have uh, other statistics and visualizations about the emotions, the sentiment of uh, the content that this individual or bot produced how the syntax of the language is, uh, uh, is used, and so forth and so on. So the gist is that you, 
can maybe you cannot learn too much other than the prediction score if you look at one single account. But what you can do, you can, you can run comparisons, right? So on the you know left hand side of this slide, you have the analysis of my account. It says, well, I'm pretty much confident that you are not a bot, even though you know it's still 26%. You might be a little a bit a bot, right? But if I look at all the features, sort of separate, uh, all the features look like human behavior, right? On the other hand, on the right side, you have uh, this Justin Bieber photo account. This is a bot. This is known to be a bot because there is a paper by Sune Lehmann, who is a professor at Denmark Technical University, who works on uh, social bot uh, design, engineering. So he creates, essentially, computer algorithms that mimic human behavior. Our system, in fact, is able to you know, tell, to determine that this account is governed by a bot. In particular, uh, the determination is uh, sort of uh, strongly biased by uh, non, not much the you know, temporal pattern or product, of production or the diffusion network information, but more really about the content and sentiment of the content. This makes a lot of sense because even though uh, when we design uh, bots, because of course from our side what we do is sort of try to reverse engineer, reverse engineer the strategies of uh, bot design, when we design the bots we can do some things very well like uh, uh, reproducing very credible uh, temporal patterns of content production, imitating, you know, the sort of circadian activity, the bursty behavior of humans. But some other things we cannot do that, that, that well. For example, content is really difficult to be produced because today, even though all the, you know, advances in natural language generation, still language models for generating uh, human-like language are not good, okay? So you can run all these comparisons, but at some point, you know, we, we, we started learning something about our system, and I'm going to make this parallel with Terminator 2. If you watch the movie, you know that there is, uh, you know, the character uh, played by Arnold Schwarzenegger, which is uh, essentially the old, unsophisticated robot. It's a very uh, sort of basic uh, cyborg, right? Under the skin, if you look very carefully, you can see the metal, and, uh, and so forth and so on. This is the kind of bots that we can detect right now. We can detect the bots that look like human, but if you really look with a, maybe a little bit of attention or a, or a magnifying glass at their features, you can find something fishy, like the metal under the skin, right? <laughs> On the other side, of the right-hand side of the picture, there is the T-1000. The T-1000 is the, you know, the most sophisticated robot in the, in the movie, and in fact, uh, is so sophisticated that it can sort of evolve and change its shape to sort of cross the defenses system <coughs> in the movie itself. And to make, you know, to draw this parallel, our system right now is unable to detect the more sophisticated bots that evolve and change their behavior because they are, uh, you know, they exhibit features that are mo much more human-like. I'm gonna give you, a, you know, a two-minute uh, technical description of our framework be before moving to the next section. We leverage several dimensions, several sort of uh, classes of uh, characteristics that you can identify in social media content. For example, as I said, the user metadata feature, the friends metadata, the timing, the content and sentiment, and so forth and so on. Then our system is constructed based on several classifiers. Uh, we don't. Uh, you know, invent any new classifier, any new machine learning framework. If you want, we take off-the-shelf machines, we train them with a data set that contains examples of 15,000 humans, 15,000 bots, so that the system can create a profile for human-like behavior, a profile for, you know, bot-like behavior, and then make a determination. And uh, when we use this data set to, you know, evaluate the performance of our system, we actually do really well. We find out, for example, that on this data set, specific data set, two models, two classifiers perform fairly well, uh, around 95% accuracy, which means essentially every time I see a bot, if I, every, every time I make a prediction and I say this is a bot, then you know, in 95% of the cases I would be correct, which is fairly good. Then we investigate a little bit more into the features that we construct to understand what are the characteristics that make bots more detectable, what are the features that are more predi the best predictors. And without much surprise, we find out first that the best predictor is the user metadata. Um, Twitter provides <coughs> publicly a lot of metadata about the users, for example, you know, the, your geographical location, if it's, uh, if it's given. Uh, how many followers, how many followers you have, and so forth and so on. These are the best predictors, the best features to make a prediction. And the second best features are the content produced. 
because as I said, content sometimes can look a little bit fishy. We look <coughs> into each of these feature classes independently. For example, take the uh, user metadata, and we start learning really something about the bots and the humans, of course, uh, on the other end. So what we find out, for example, is that bots produce way less new tweets than humans, but they, all, but they produce way more retweets than humans. And this is kind of intuitive, once again. Producing new tweets, producing new com content is difficult, but simply rebroadcasting, retweeting what other people say, it's costless, right? On the other hand, you know, they have, uh, for example, very long user names, because sometimes the user names are generated automatically by concatenating random strings, random characters. They are mentioned and replied way less than humans, because probably they produce not very interesting content, and therefore they are not addressed so often. We do this exercise with beneficiaries, and we learn, you know, we, we learned a little bit about how sort of human behave and perform on social media, and, and on the other hand, how uh, social bots behave, and how we can leverage this information to detect. So this is sort of short, short summary of this part, and uh, I try to convince you that this is, of course, a very interesting problem in terms not only of social but also economical relevance. Uh, this was a very gratifying project. Uh, in fact, we got a lot of positive uh, sort of feedback from uh, many outlets like, you know, BB BBC, MIT Technology Review, and so forth and so on. But once again, in this hyper-democratic environment of the, you know, of the, of the um, internet, we got also some critique. This is one great example. This uh, Daily Dot article says, oh, the U.S. government is spending about a million dollars to figure out memes. And I mean, if you read the article, this makes sense, but unfortunately, uh, well, there are some arguments that make sense, and they say, well, maybe this is not a really interesting problem. I argued differently, but, you know, everyone is entitled to his opinion. Unfortunately, the uh, step is short from here to ending up, you know, on Fox News, right? So there is Megan Kelly, there is a full four-minute service uh, um, with some expert uh, talking about how Indiana University and our team is building a sort of database of hate speech and stuff like that. In fact, the day after, uh, even worse, Phil Menzer is on Fox News, and I, I assume no one is happy to be on Fox News, or you know, for what that matters on any you know national broadcast. If it's you know, if you get some sort of a, fa a false statement or smearing attack in uh, in, in in your um, uh, of, of your work, right? So interesting fact: a few days after, of course, this story was debunked because it was sort of full of imprecise things. For, from the Columbia Journalism Review and from many other uh, important news magazines. But the gist, I think you got it, is that at this point what we want to do is not only anymore assessing the value of a given account, but we want to move a step forward. We want to assess the value of a given entire conversation. Of course, this is a much more complicated task, right? We want to determine, for example, whether you know, some entire conversation is a genuine, grassroots, organic, like in the bottom left part, or if you separate along, uh, say, the information diffusion axis on the x-axis, you can have a conversation that is sort of sponsored, support, for example, advertised. And of course, here I'm not saying that advertisement is bad. Advertisement is just a mechanism of spreading information, and you know, if you go to business school, they teach you how to do advertisement effectively. Simply, what I'm arguing is that our systems and ourselves you know, we need to be able to determine whether something is sponsored or not. It shouldn't be hidden, right? And on the same uh, sort of uh, line, if you look at the y-axis on the sort of credibility of information content, you can see that sometimes information is truthful, some other times information can be sort of misleading or non-accurate and so forth and so on. If you combine these two dimensions, you get what we call a complex persuasion, and uh, eventually we want to go in the direction of be being able to detect this kind of persuasion campaigns or campaigns online. So this is one example of our project. What we want to do is uh, uh, identifying uh, um, and you know, sort of predicting whether a trending conversation, and we focus only on trending conversations, which are those that attract a lot of attention, whether a trending conversation is organic, so people talk about it sort of a uh, grassroots, or is promoted. Someone is paying for it. Luckily enough, Twitter tells whether an hashtag, a given conversation, is promoted or not, or is organic. So what we did was harvesting all these hashtags promoted and non-promoted during a, a long period of a few months. We got, 
fairly large data set. And then we have examples of organic versus examples of promoted hashtags, trending hashtags. And what I want to show very briefly is that this problem of separating hashtags which are promoted or not is very complicated even for humans. If you look at the right hand side of uh, this table of examples, you have uh, some uh, uh, organic hashtags like Football Club Barcelona, Symbiotic Titans, The Undertaker, Only Westeros. All these hashtags are organic. They, come organic, orga they become trending organically from uh, conversation on Twitter, but they all convey some brands, some entities, you know, TV shows, uh, sport teams, and so forth and so on, right? So if you know a little bit of marketing, good. This is good advertising, but instead it's spontaneous sort of organic conversation. On the other side, on the left side, you have some hashtags wh uh, which are promoted. Uh, people are paying millions of dollars to make these hashtag trendings. Get happy, survive the night, make boring brilliant, it's not so complicated, and so forth and so on. These hashtags don't convey any brand, don't convey any entity, any product, right? So they are not the best examples of, uh, you know, sort of advertisement done right, but still these are sort of, you know, examples of hashtags which have been promoted on Twitter. So even for humans, separating these in the right, you know, categories would be very challenging. Imagine for a machine that doesn't know anything about marketing and stuff like that, right? So our goal is create a framework that can, a computational framework, that can do this in a smart way. Once again, we leverage all the uh, features that I said before, but one important peculiar characteristic of our framework now is that it's uh, not anymore a static snapshot like in the case of bots. I take a picture of the bot at this very moment and I tell you, you know, it's a bot or it's a human. In this case, we have the entire history of the conversation and it's something that evolves over time. It's a temporal evolution. So we somehow leverage machine learning frameworks to encode these temporal patterns. And uh, what we get is a machinery that eventually with uh, somehow close, something close to 87, 88% of accuracy is able to determine whether a trending conversation has been promoted or not. So we have a framework that uh, this time dynamically over time is able to make predictions. In case <coughs> you are curious, now there are not anymore some static classes of features that are best predictors all the times. Now the features predict, uh, you know, some, uh, depending on when you make the prediction in time, closer to the trending point or after the moment this conversation became trending and so forth and so on, depending if you want to make an early prediction or a late classification, the features uh, have different importance. For example, if you want to make an early prediction, the temporal patterns and the timing activity are very powerful, but if you want to make a later classification, the network and the sentiment of the content are extremely important. And this is uh, just to conclude how our machine comes uh, to a sort of outcome. Uh, you know, on the right hand side, you have Galaxy Family. This was an example of a promoted hashtag, and our machine correctly identifies that. On the other side, Galaxy S4 is an organic hashtag correctly identified by our system. So to summarize also this and go towards conclusion, our system is able to allow us to make some fairly accurate prediction and classification of promoted versus organic conversation online. And this is done essentially leveraging the temporal evolution of these conversations in, uh, in social media. Eventually, uh, the, you know, the stuff that I presented today goes under a larger umbrella of uh, projects that we have here at CNETS. And uh, I hope you are interested in, you know, talking about this. We have been looking at trends, as I said before. We have been looking at social media uh, protests like Occupy Wall Street, the Gezi Park protest in, uh, in uh, Turkey. And all of these got great feedback, and uh, we are really proud of it. And this is another research line that I've been uh, pursuing in parallel with uh, a collaboration with the Army in Italy, which is about criminal network analysis, essentially using large-scale network data from... Um, mobile phone conversation, financial transactions, social media, so online social networks, interactions, and so forth and so on, to sort of detect uh, uh, criminal activity and, uh, you know, crim uh, sort of frame criminal suspects and find new um, um, criminal connections in the real world. And uh, essentially before concluding, uh, well, this was also very successful. It ended up in the uh, cover news of the communication of the ACN. So before concluding, I want to thank all my collaborators, the, PI of the PIs of the project, Phil and Sandro, and all the students who uh, worked on these projects. Without them, nothing of this would happen. Thank you.
This is a pretty interesting uh, uh, question because, uh, well, first of all, of course, I don't have a definitive answer. Uh, as an organization, uh, there are many people who will interact with the same account, plus some operations might be automatized, automatized, right? So, you know, people might post content to the account and then the account simply sort of uh, uh, dispatches the content over time, something like that. So there is, a, in literature, there is a term for these uh, bots, they are not social bots in the strict term, but they are called cyborgs. So they are a mixture of human and machine. And uh, it's even more complicated to detect those because they exhibit way more human features than, generally speaking, for example, the content is generated by the humans. Yeah. Yeah. How do you identify the bots? This is done. Yeah, so this is done uh, not from, from our group, but from James, James Coverley, Texas A&M. What they did was designing a onip, social, they call it social, social onipot. Essentially, it's a trap. They create some accounts that generate gibberish, random, you know, posts, no, meaningless. And uh, then uh, all the accounts that repost, retweet, or follow those accounts essentially are uh, red flagged. They might be bots because they are not performing any activity that a human would do. They manually inspect those versus another ground truth sample of 15,000 humans, and then they manually validate each and all of them, and they come up with this data set that they shared for our training. And is there an estimate on the number of bots? So there is, a, there is an official estimate from Twitter uh, from uh, December 2014, so two months ago, a month ago. Yeah, uh, they say it's between five and eight percent, but they talk about the content, not the users. So they say about five and eight percent of content produced is synthetic, and uh, they, they, their definition is very vague. So it's really unclear, you know, how they compute that or, uh, you know, what they include in this synthetic artificial content. Thanks again.